This podcast is a presentation of Indianola First Assembly of God Church. For more information, please visit us online at indianolafirst.com. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. I mean, it's good to get back into church after Thanksgiving and start worshiping again because we've kind of worshiped our bodies all weekend, haven't we? (laughs) Kind of have a little bit of a flesh time where we just feed our faces and sleep on the couch and how many had to unbutton their top button on their pants? Nobody? A couple of you did. (laughs) Yeah, praise the Lord. You awake this morning? Hallelujah. I just love this time of year. I, I absolutely love it, and I hope you do too. I mean, one holiday is just coming to an end, and another one just starts ramping up. And it's, it's the sales on Black Friday, it's the Cyber Monday, it's the, the Christmas programs and parties, the delicious family traditional foods, the hot chocolate and festive treats, it's Hallmark movies. Can I hear it for Hallmark movies? Yeah. Yeah. My mother-in-law is staying with us, she, as she always does over the Christmas holidays, and it's been non-stop Hallmark movies at my house. I'm available for appointments anytime, just call me over to your house. Love those Hallmark movies. It's wonderful family moments and holiday memories relived. That's what, that's what this season brings. And everyone loves Christmas, but, but I think if we could peel back the smiles and the laughter, we might see some of the same people that look like they're having so much fun, I think we could see them a little bit differently. We all know that there are those who put on happy faces just to cover their pain. And we all know that there are those that use laughter to hide their broken hearts. But I believe that there are far more people experiencing this than we even would realize People who deep down inside have a hard time with this season because it seems to only serve and remind them of that loved one who is no longer with them. Grief behind the smiling faces. Extreme grief that's robbing them of true joy. And uh, they ask themselves, I think, in so many cases, how they will ever get through these next weeks with everyone so happy and so together while they are silently screaming out in their loneliness. Trying to adjust to a new normal while emotionally fighting to hold on to the old one. And of course there are those that uh, they themselves have received a bad doctor's report and it's overwhelming to think about telling family and friends that aside from a miracle of healing they may not be around for too many more Christmases. It's a hard conversation to have with your family. There are those who see this season as just another financial burden in their lives. I mean, they've had years of struggle in some cases, and Christmas with all the company and baking and the presents, not to mention the cost of eating your home, it just seems like the burden that that they've been carrying becomes even heavier financially during this time of year. And there's nothing like a good old family gathering with relatives that you don't want to be around to fill you with that wonderful Christmas spirit. Why is it that those who we are closest to say the meanest things? Why is it that we sometimes treat the ones we love the most so poorly? Words that have been spoken, snide comments that reek with insecurity, hateful rhetoric that cuts deep into the heart and soul. And what about the times when no words are spoken, but should be? The silent treatment, right? Being ignored completely at these family gatherings because of some perceived issue or situation that may or may not even ever have happened. This isn't how families should act, but in some cases, in many cases, Christmas and the family get-togethers that the holiday season bring about are just another source of pain that's masked by the smiles. And these are just a few reasons for the pain, the, the, the hardship that people experience during this season. There are always whys behind the tears people cry in the middle of the night when no one else is around. And you may not be one of those this morning, and praise God for that. But if you are, I want you to know that Jesus Christ hears you in your silent night. He knows, he cares, and he loves you with an everlasting love. And this morning I know that there isn't a quick fix 
to some of these issues. I know that you can't wave a magic wand and instantly make everything all better. But I do wanna share with you some truths from scripture that will help you rise above any pain you're hiding. Truths that will help you keep focused on Jesus throughout the Christmas season. And actually they are, some, they are the same scriptural truths that are behind the traditional Advent wreath that so many of us grew up with. Tradition can be a bad thing when it's followed for tradition's sake. But it's a wonderful thing if it's followed to keep biblical truth from being forgotten or lost. We must never forget what Advent is all about. Advent literally means the coming or the arrival. And the advent of Christ to this earth, his coming, his arrival, is the very thing we celebrate at Christmas. And it carries with it all that he brought with him as he was born in that stable and laid in the manger so many years ago. His advent was simultaneously the advent of of hope, of love, of joy, of peace, the very things that seem unattainable to those that find themselves struggling throughout this holiday season. And maybe as a reminder throughout this Christmas season, you should all set up an Advent wreath in your home. It's a great tradition. We have one up here, and we'll be lighting a candle every single week, and another candle uh, on the wreath. But these are to stand as a reminder to us that with the coming of Christ came hope, came love, came joy, came peace. That's what Jesus brought into the world when he was born that first Christmas evening. Each week, take some time as a family and light that week's candle and take some time to talk about the truth that's behind it. What a great thing to do at Christmas time. Maybe, maybe it would even turn into family devotions. And how awesome would that be? And if your kids are gone, pray with your wife. Talk about it with your spouse, your husband, whoever you have. I think it's wonderful to have these kinds of times together. So this morning I want to start with, and I'm just going to go around the wreath in, with the candles, and I'm going to talk about the advent of hope, the first candle to begin with, the advent of hope. Your situation may seem hopeless. You may be going through a lot. You may be hurting on the inside, smiling on the outside, hurting on the inside, but the truth of the matter is that we have so much hope as Christians, it should be hard to keep us from jumping out of our own skins with excitement. You can rest easy tonight no matter what you're going through, and I mean no matter what. As I look out of this congregation, I blind, oh, there I can see you. I can never see you unless I do this. But as I look out on the congregation, I see a lot of excitements right? Actually, this morning, I see a lot of (laughs) turkey, turkey. That's what I see. But we should be jumping out of our skins with excitement because of the hope that's in us. There is a ton of hope that we have as Christians, and it's a wonderful thing to have hope. We have a Savior who loves us with an everlasting love, We have a savior who will never leave us or forsake us. We have a savior who has gone to prepare a place for us that words can't even begin to describe. He's our provider, he's our deliverer, he's our strong tower, our fortress, our protector, our rock. And Christmas is the celebration of all of this, folks. The advent of Christ brought the advent of hope. Plain and simple, Matthew 1.23 says this, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. God himself, because of that first Christmas, is now with us. Christmas was the advent of hope. What could give us hope more than the knowledge that our God is not just an unconcerned deity in the sky? Our Savior is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Amen? And he is with us through every difficult thing we go through. He carries us. He holds us in the palm of his hand. Don't lose sight of the hope that is now ours because of that first Christmas. You say, well, that all happened through the cross. That's true, but the cross would have never happened without Christmas. Jesus had to come into the world. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. He had to come into the world before all that would take place. We celebrate Christmas as the advent of Christ, but as the advent of hope. 
hope came into the world. Because he came, there is hope for healing. There is hope for deliverance. There is hope for reconciliation. There is hope for provision. There is hope for heaven. And you can take this to the bank. Every place in scripture where the word hope appears, the original word, whether it was in Hebrew in the Old Testament or Greek in the New Testament, carries with it the idea of absolute assurance. There is no connotation of doubt within these original words that we translate into the word hope. And this is significant, church, because we often say in our English language, I hope it turns out okay. I hope you get the results you want. I hope we win. I hope my husband didn't forget to pay that bill. All these uses of the word hope in our language convey doubt, don't they? But in scripture, if you take back to the original words, this word has no doubt attached to it whatsoever. No negative overtone whatsoever in either Hebrew or Greek. Hear me, church, biblical hope is absolute assurity. It's absolute assurity. S. Michael Houdman defines biblical hope like this, and I love this definition. It says, it's a confident expectation or assurance based upon a sure foundation for which we wait with joy and full confidence. I love that. That's biblical hope. Absolute confidence. No doubt whatsoever. Don't let doubt and ultimately fear creep into your Christmas. Christmas is the advent of hope, not doubt. There is hope. I don't care what you're going through, and I do care, but no matter what you're going through is what I'm trying to say. You don't have to fall apart because you have hope. You have hope. Christmas and the advent, the coming, or the arrival of Christ also is the advent of love. It's the second candle that we'll light next week. And I want you to imagine for just a second the kind of love someone would have to have in order to give up everything they had. Their stuff, their position, their status, everything. We know the Christmas story really well. I mean, that there was no room at the inn and Mary and Joseph took shelter in a stable. We can can picture our nativity scenes and and we can set them up and, and, and imagine how it must have been. We can picture it in our minds. We can close our eyes and imagine it all. But when was the last time you meditated and thought and tried to imagine on what Jesus left in order to make his arrival here on earth as a human being? What did he have to give up? What, have, you, have you thought about that? What he left to come here? Philippians 2, 6-7 through seven says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. I want you to understand something. Jesus, God, became man. He's 100% God. He's 100% man, making him 200% of a person, right? He emptied himself of his deity as he came to earth in a humble way. He left his glory. Think about that. That's how much he loved you. He left everything, all of his glory, to come to us as Emmanuel. The love for us that had to exist in his heart in order for him to do that, it's immeasurable. Loneliness is often felt by many during the Christmas season. Maybe because family is too far away or it's not financially feasible to be together or maybe it's just because your spouse has gone to be with the Lord or maybe even your child has gone to be with the Lord. But loneliness is a difficult thing to endure. But to know that Jesus Christ loved us so much that he emptied himself of his glory to come and be born in a lowly stable to be be the king of kings and have your first bed be an animal feeding trough It's a love that can heal any wound or any loneliness you have. He left all of that for you. He is Emmanuel. He is God with you. It's an everlasting love that can't, that you you really can't nail down a definition to describe it. And ironically, that may be the best definition. 
a perfect being allowing his own creation to nail him down to a cross. The cross of Jesus Christ, again, embodied the meaning of the word love more than any single event in all of history. That's Good Friday and Easter, of course, but these would, wouldn't exist if Jesus hadn't first left his glory for you and for me. He left it all. That's love. And guys, you're not alone. You are not alone. In the middle of these silent nights where Tears flow freely. You, you have to cling to the truth of his love, especially during this Christmas season. It's easy to get bitter when you see others enjoying their families, enjoying their spouse, and yours has fallen apart. It's easy to get bitter or angry with God, but you have to cling on to the, the fact that he loves you with an everlasting love, and he did not do this to your family. We blame God for a lot of things he has nothing to do with. Am, am, I, am I speaking truth this morning? I mean, we always blame God for all the bad stuff, don't we? And when something good happens, we don't give him any credit. I mean, come on. We like to blame him. And you know, when we do that, we're really, what we're really saying is that, you know, we're puppets, God, and we're on the string, and, and you've got us dancing around, and why did, you make, why did you make this happen, and why did you do this, and why did you do that? You know, he gave us all free will, and free will affects the entire world, doesn't it? It can affect, somebody else's free will can definitely affect you. Your free will sets the course of your life, yet we blame God. Church, you're not alone in feeling lonely. There's many that do but cling to the fact that Jesus Christ loves you with an everlasting love. In Deuteronomy 31.8, it says, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you. It says he will not leave you. It says he will not leave you. It says he will not leave you. It's a broken record, right? He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Jesus Christ loves you with an everlasting love. Open your heart to him, especially, especially if your heart is broken. Psalms 147.3 says, he heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. Christmas was the advent of love. Love, real love came into the world in an awesome, awesome way. With Christmas also came the advent of joy. It's represented by the pink candle. It's the third candle in the Advent wreath. Joy is not a word that's used very often outside of the church, is it? It would be rare to hear someone say, wow, you are sure joyful today. It wouldn't be commonplace to say, I just feel so joyful today. Maybe for a Christian it would be, but normally that just wouldn't come out of people's mouths. The word that we would be most commonly used in these situations would be happy, right? Happiness is a feeling we feel. It's a wonderful feeling, and we often long to live within its mirage of security. And I, I say mirage because even though deep, deep down most people spend most of their time, time pursuing happiness, it's not the feeling of happiness that they're really needing or really even desiring. What they truly desire, but are often over, unaware of it, is that they want joy. They're looking for joy. They're seeking joy. Joy goes beyond the emotion of happiness. Joy is more of a state of mind, church. It's, a, it's rooted in a personal relationship with our creator himself. I personally believe that true joy can only be found in Jesus. That's it. There's no other place to find real joy. Anything else is just a cheap substitute. Luke 2, 8 through 12 says this, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you tidings, good tidings of great which will be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger." Jesus Christ's birth was the advent of joy 
We would now be able to experience true joy through a relationship with him. Joy doesn't leave because our situation or our circumstance changes. It exists in spite of those things. Joy in the midst of the trial. Joy in the midst of the worst thing you could ever think about going through. We can have joy as Christians because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen, because that's just truth. It's a hard truth sometimes. I mean, how many know you gotta decide to be joyful? I mean, I'm going through it, but I'm putting my foot down and I'm gonna count it all joy, no matter what. Yeah. Don't forget that joy is yours through your relationship with Christ. He offers eternal joy in a world that can only offer temporary happiness at best. Everybody's looking for happiness, little things that make them happy. I wanna be happy, I wanna be happy, I wanna be happy. Man, give it all to Jesus and just rest in his joy. Let it become a state of mind. The fourth candle, or the advent of peace. You know, when I was young and my parents would go away for the weekend, we maybe would get a phone call when uh, they got to their destination, and that was about it. We would uh, have to call the front desk of the hotel they were staying at and leave a message for them to call us if there was an emergency. It wasn't like we could talk anytime we wanted. There was no cell phones, right? And um, there was no FaceTime or anything like that. And this was so far back in the day that if you told us there would be technology that would allow us to write short letters to each other through our phones and we would receive them instantly, we would have thought you were crazy. Not because we were unbelieving of the technology, but because why would anyone want to do that, right? When you could just talk on the phone. Anyway, it's funny how we didn't feel anxiety about our parents being gone all weekend. It's funny how our parents didn't feel anxiety about leaving us, even though they couldn't call us every waking moment. We have phones that work now just like Captain Kirk's communicator in the fictitious world of Star Trek, right? Remember that thing? There it is right there. And that's how our cell phones work, right? That's actually old school. That's flip phone, right? Flip communicator. And my point is this, with all the technology that we have at our fingertips, with all the advances in psychology even, and psychiatry, with all of the self-help books and support groups and even medication that we have available to us today, it seems like we have never suffered from anxiety and restlessness and manic depressive behaviors more than we ever have today. It's crazy to think about. Take away cell phones, just as an example, and, and many people fall apart. I need that cell phone. I've got to know what's going on all the time. I've got to be able to text everybody. How many remember the world where, you know, you might not talk to each other for a week at a time? The world was slower, right? I'm not talking intellectually. It was just slower. It moved at a slower pace. We enjoyed things more, didn't we? There was less anxiety about everything. Now that we can talk to everybody, we're like, oh, oh everything's going apart. You know, we just get crazy. I mean, don't believe me? Go to the middle school and take away all the phones for a day and see what happens in the middle school. You'll have anarchy on your hands. Am I right? Teachers, am I right? Yeah. With all this stuff, I, I know it's not a popular thing to say, but the, but the more helps, the more stuff we seem to have available to us the worse we are as people, worse off we are. Maybe we're putting our trust in the wrong thing. Not that these things are all bad. I, I think most of them have great benefits. But our quest for inner peace should always begin with the Prince of Peace. I mean, that just seems like common sense to me. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. With the birth of Christ came the advent of peace, real peace. Peace for, the, for, for every weary mind that longs for it. I don't think it's by accident that this prophetic verse about Jesus being the Prince of Peace in Isaiah, 
which was written, by the way, hundreds of years before Jesus was born and was fulfilled by Jesus' birth, I don't believe that it's by accident that it contains the words government and counselor. I mean, think about this for a minute. Um, There is a lot of anxiety in our nation right now. Politics and governments and division and political turmoil. and, and, And there's a lot of personal anxieties as well, isn't there? And I think we, we have never, again, we've never had more avenues of help, yet we often miss the real peace that's right in front of our eyes. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the government is on his shoulders. Amen. I mean, that's what the Word of God says. What are we getting all worked up about? I'm not saying we should be passive. I'm just saying we should trust. The government's on his shoulders. He's called counselor. You know, I, 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 I'm not dissing counseling. I think counseling's wonderful. I encourage people to come in and get counsel from the pastors here. But honestly, the first thing you should do when you're feeling overwhelmed is take it to the Lord in prayer and let him counsel you. Because he will. He's the great counselor. Not taking away anything from counselors, okay? Don't get me wrong. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Maybe that short little verse should be our anthem every day, some of us. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And when those feelings of anxiousness begin to well up within you, you can say, wait, Jesus Christ cares for me. So I am casting right now all of my anxieties upon him because he cares for me that much, and he'll take them. Maybe we need to get so good at following Scripture that we actually live it. You know? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That seems pretty simple, doesn't it? I don't know, maybe easier said than done. It comes through prayer, though. Spending time with him, spending time in his presence. God, take this away. It's all yours. I laid at the foot of your cross, and when I get up from God's presence to go do what I have to do for the day, I'm not going to pick up that anxiety and put it back on. I'm going to leave it there at the cross. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, don't worry about anything except the bills, your relationships, um, your kids, your parents, your health, um, the weather, um, the, the, the politics of the nation, um, don't, worry about any, don't, don't worry about anything except those things. Is that what it says? No. It says don't worry about anything. Anything. What aren't you supposed to worry about? Anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. No matter how bad the storm is raging in your life during this Christmas season, remember that Christmas is celebrating the birth of the one who said, peace, be still. And when he did, the wind and the waves obeyed him. He can do that in your life if you let him. Spend time with him. I like what Pastor Jared said right after worship. Just, I mean, don't have an agenda. You know, you had Mary and Martha, right? It wasn't Martha just running around doing stuff. Just working, 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 right? How many, how many have ever fallen into the Martha syndrome? Am I the only, well, there's a few honest ones. I'm raising both hands because I, I doubly fail in that area. We should be like Mary. Nothing wrong with working hard. Nothing wrong with that. But at some point, you've got to stop and lay before Christ and just sit in his presence and worship him. And let him say, peace be still in your life. I think when we do that, we'll find that many of our anxieties that we've been feeling and been dealing with are, just won't mean all that much to us. They'll just fall to the wayside. Many of them. 
Just settle down and be still and know that he is God. In church, the scriptural truths of hope, love, joy, and peace, making their arrival simultaneously with the advent of Christ, should help you understand that he hears you and he knows what you are going through. Even in the midst of all the celebration around you during this season, he hears you in your silent night. And if you've just been going through it lately, and Christmas this year seems more like a reminder of your broken heart than it does a celebration, I want to invite you to do something this morning. Because I know, I know there's people that are hurting. There's people who are not here today because they're going through it so much. And if you're watching online, I just invite you to, to, to make an altar where you're at. But if you're here today, I invite you to come forward to these altars and just let God... Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First Assembly of God podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest message.